Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Michelle Graff. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at National Jeweler. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome everyone to the latest episode of My Next Question, National Jewelers webinar series, which is sponsored this month by the Diamond Council of America. Today's session features all four National Jeweler editors, and we'll be having a discussion about the recent Las Vegas jewelry shows. So before I turn the discussion over to myself and the other editors, I just want to let our attendees know that if they have a question, they can drop it into the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom of their screens. I'll be back on after discussion to share any questions with our panelists. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the National Jeweler website this coming Friday, June 24th. Now we'll get things started. Hi, everyone. Good to see you again. Hi, team. Hello. Hi. Um, and thanks to all our audience members or participants for joining us today. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about uh, the Las Vegas jewelry shows, which just wrapped up the week before last. Um, this for Brecken and Lenore, this was their first time back in Las Vegas since 2019. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, and right. for Ashley and I, we went last August, but this was obviously our first time back and it's kind of semi-normal time slot in June. Um, so we're going to talk first a little bit about the mood of the shows and what we kind of just over, uh, observed overall about the vibe, attendance. And Ashley, I'm going to start with you as our main, our fashion editor and our main reporter at Couture. What, what did you feel like when you were at Couture this year? Um, it, for me, I thought it really felt like a normal show. Um, there was, it seemed to be really good attendance. Um, it felt very lively. There wasn't really even talk of the pandemic. It felt kind of back to pre-pandemic um, times. And yeah, I felt like very few people were wearing masks, I guess, you know, just at this stage in the pandemic, um, a few people were, but I felt that the mood was very lively, very social, friendly, and people seemed very happy to be kind of back in action. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to toss it over to you, Breck. And you can, you went obviously to JCK as well. You were particularly in the gem halls a lot, Anna Couture. Um, what, what was your take on the mood overall? Um, yeah, I would sort of mirror what Ashley was saying. I think everybody just seemed really happy to be back. Business seemed really good. Um, I think that when you talk about, you know, specifically the, the gem people, Las Vegas is a little bit more of like, let's go to get our, you know, be out there in front of people rather than we expect a lot of business. So I, I heard, you know, show was fair to good um, when you're looking at like the gem hall of JCK. But the big thing for them was also, you know, AGTA returned to the JCK show and they had a spot on the show floor that, you know, flowed pretty well. So they were getting some foot traffic as people were finding their way there. So I think they were really happy to be back at JCK specifically. And, you know, I think they were happy with the turnout all told. See, people seemed really positive, I'd say. Yeah. And I mean, for gems, especially, I would guess that Tucson is like the the show for gem buying right. in the United States. Right. Exactly. And that's where so, a lot of buying goes. Yeah. Goes so they out. were only like a few months away from that. You know, no one's there, I think, in Vegas, the wholesalers, at least the dealers thinking, you know, we're going to sell a lot of gems. A lot of their clients at that point were either exhibitors or they were focused on other things. So they, they're sort of there just to, you know, get their face out there, that kind of thing. Right, right. And Lenore, I'd love to get your take on the mood and atmosphere at the antique show because this, I did not get to the antique show this time, although I have heard that next year it's going to be moving back to the win yes. with Couture, which I think will be easier. I prefer that. I didn't make it over to the convention center this year, but Lenore did. What was that like over there? And it was just the antique show there, right? Correct? Yes, it was just the antique show there. Um, it was my first time there, so I don't have anything to compare it to. Um, but the mood was definitely similar to JCK and Couture, a little quieter, but I think that has to do with it being so far away from the rest of the shows. Um, yes, yeah, so a little quieter, a little more low key, um, but definitely a very happy vibe. People very excited to be back, um, very excited to show you their jewelry. Um, yeah, just so an overall very happy, happy to be back sort of vibe. So I went to all the shows except the antique show, and I would say the same that I felt like for me, I've been in the industry since 2007, and I said this to a couple of people at the show, this is as happy and as um, positive and as optimistic 
in as busy as I've seen the industry literally since I've been in it since 2007. This is like the biggest streak of jewelry buying that I've witnessed in my time at National Jeweler, which isn't, you know, I haven't been in the industry 40 or 50 years, but I definitely have, have put my time in. And I was talking to some people at the shows and I thought the same thing that the shows seemed very crowded. Um, there were very few people wearing masks, which is obviously a personal choice. I don't know what Couture's rules about it were, but I know that with JCK and Lenore, you put this in your pre-JCK story that masks were recommended, but not required. Yes, right. Um, so that was obviously people's choice. Um, and I also thought like it just, the show seemed very upbeat and people seem very happy both because business is good and because I think people generally missed each other like there were a lot of people like friends in the industry I consider who I hadn't seen since 2009 or even before and on top of that someone told me that you know a lot of times the Las JCK Las Vegas particularly is a lot of networking and meeting and greeting and there's a lot more buying that goes on at other shows but they said Mm -hmm. this year with the feedback they were giving from exhibitors is people weren't there just to look people were buying. It's also a little bit closer to Christmas than it usually is because it's usually late May. And this time it was more mid June-ish. So that could be part of it too. Maybe they were like just ready to make orders because Christmas is now, the holiday season is now a few weeks closer, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, So I want to move on and talk about something that interests everybody. And it's kind of the big tell of Couture in Las Vegas is what are the trends? Like What are we seeing? What were we seeing in Las Vegas? It's going to tell us about what's going to be popular in the second half of 2020 and going into 2023. And Ashley, I'm going to start with you on this one. Yeah, I think for me, the biggest trend would just have to be color. Um, And that was expressed in several different ways by designers. Um, So for instance, Aisley, a designer who has been very dedicated to diamonds throughout her career, um, finally dipped her toes into emeralds a couple of seasons ago. And now she had all these new sapphire pieces. So I think that that was kind of, for me, an indicator of even the most um, diamond dedicated brands kind of venturing into new um, gemstone varieties or different forms of color. Melissa Kay launched an entirely new collection of colored gemstone pieces. So she is um, really known for kind of pushing the conversation in color. And she's primarily... the one that did all that neon enamel a few years ago. Yeah. Okay. So she, um, you know, she's always kind of pushed the envelope and kind of done things that most people aren't really doing with color. So yeah, whether that was getting into neon enamel or pastels, you know, introducing these colors that we hadn't really seen in fine jewelry. So now she made a big push for colored gemstones and the way she did it was um, with incorporating them um, into her kind of cool enamel aesthetic. So like cocktail pieces, like cocktail rings um, and tennis necklaces with colored gemstones with um, an enamel border or halo around them. So that created some really cool, like contrasting color stories. Um, And it was very fun to see. And enamel in general was, I felt was still a um, a really prevalent trend happening at Couture. So for instance, Salim Muzanar has been really big on enamel for years and he kind of has been experimenting with guilloche and um, creating his own guilloche patterns so um, that there's just a lot of visual interest in like a single medallion because you have really cool um, enamel colors and you see really cool metalwork beneath it. So um, that was kind of a fun way that he was branching into color. Arc Fine Jewelry had really great plique jour enamel, which has been something that that designer has kind of been playing with over the last year, maybe a bit more. Um, Emily Wheeler was another one who had, I mean, she does fabulous colored gemstone pieces and tons of one of a kinds. And she also had some striped enamel that was very fun. Um, another kind of smaller trend I saw were gemstone beads. Um, so those were from designers like 
Aisley, Jamela, and Soralina. And Soralina also had um, also had really cool lockets, which I thought was kind of a, a smaller trend. I saw great lockets from her, um, also from Rena. And then there was a brand called Marie Lichtenberg who debuted a couture and has like these, um, like she's known for um, these kind of antique and vintage inspired pendants and then she introduced um different styles of pendants and some really cool lockets and like sometimes with like interesting um stones inside so it's like you open it for a little surprise um so okay. yeah just to add on to that sorry marie lichtenberg won best in debuting at couture and mm -hmm. another the other designer you just mentioned emily p wheeler with her beautiful color gemstones she had this gorgeous aquamarine collar that won best in color gemstones above twenty thousand, and it's beautiful and you can check it out in our story about towards design awards if you like but i'm sorry ashley go ahead no no that's that's a great point um and i think yeah i think that really bold happy colorful mood is just very prevalent right now um and what? What do you think is driving, real quick question, what do you think is, because we hear about color everywhere, like people are into colored everything. What do you think is driving the interest in color? Is it like, do people feel like they're breaking out of the pandemic kind of haze? Is that why people want to come out being bold and colorful? Is it making people more cheerful? Because I mean, we see color everywhere and everything. It's a trend. Yeah, um, I think, I think that that's definitely part of it because I feel like almost all designers when they talk about recent collections, they'll always talk about designing during the pandemic and wanting to create things that were really, um, really positive and really meaningful and that kind of celebrated the spirit of being together. And so I think that is part of it, that um, sort of optimistic take. And then it doesn't hurt when your sales are really good to then just keep ex uh, experimenting with um, more colors and bigger pieces when you see people gravitating toward those statement pieces. And I also think in general, just the mood of jewelry, just with the way that there are so many independent designers today, that the more kind of eye-catching and design forward that you can be, um, it just kind of garners more attention. You yeah. know, the di the designers that don't really deal as much in the basics, I would say. And then, of course, there's always a place for the basics. But I think Couture really focuses on um, a little more design forward brands in general. Um, and kind of going off of that joyful mood, I felt like cocktail rings were really big and then... Um, what I want to call just like cocktail necklaces, because I feel like they're just the equivalent of, you know, a big juicy gemstone, some kind of cool gold um, metalwork, but, you know, as a pendant. And I saw really cool ones from Beck for cocktail rings and um, Brett Neal, of course, a retro buy. And um, Jamela had fabulous um, necklaces like that with, with big, beautiful gemstones. And then just to get um, a little more niche, I felt like um, some designers were like branching out into really cool animal motifs, like Harmel Godfrey was one. Um, the, snake, the, the crab, the crab. Yeah, oh, the crab was like, that was the best one, I feel like. But yeah, Me just too. really like unique pieces, which I mean, it's amazing to know that you have that client that will go for something super unique and different and not the most wearable for the average person. Um, Kadar is somebody, somebody who had a little bit more of like a sleek wearable version of that. Um, and they're a brand that, that doesn't really do color. They're very about their gold. Yeah. Um, and they had like some really beautiful like snake pieces. Um, they also had just a ton of like really graphic pieces. They were, um, and their inspiration was for their newest pieces was um, 
just different tribal cultures. So going back to like lots of like spirals um, and like graphic shapes and like big square hoops that are just like so luxurious looking um, and just really simple, but these strong impactful shapes. And I felt like, yeah, Kadar had a lot of that. And I felt like um, Susanna Martins was another one who I thought had like lots of great graphic shapes and um, that brand has tons of cool enamel too. So they're, they're based in the UAE, but they made their couture debut this year and it was really fun to see them as well. So those were kind of like the main trends. That okay. I yeah, I think those, those are all really great trends. And I would like to say on the animal jewelry note, I told several people at the shows that I do not feel like there is enough cat jewelry, particularly house <laughs> cat jewelry. So maybe we could remedy that going forward. But I did love Hartwell Godfrey's her owl, her crab, her snake, um, the baboon monkey, they were all, they were all just exquisite. Um, yeah. I love those trends. I like animals and I love animals and jewelry. So Bracken, I'm going to throw it over to you next. And I want you to talk specifically a little bit about what you saw at the gem shows. Sure. Well, I was going to, I was going to, you know, going off the back of one of the things Ashley mentioned, one of the first things I wrote down when I was not only talking to the gem dealers, but looking at the finished jewelry, just to keep an eye on what was what had already been set, um, was just these really bright colors, just really happy colors that really pop, um, which I assumed had to do with, you know, just sort of the optimism of the year of wanting to get out of, you know, this, a certain state of mind and into a new one. Um, and then I also, what I found really interesting was, I think, I feel like I saw a lot of turquoise um, in terms of the shows in set jewelry even from brands who might have had like um, maybe simpler gold staples that were suddenly finding uses for even like little turquoise calves. Um, I just felt like I was seeing it everywhere. And maybe that's part of the, you know, color pop as well, like a nice piece of turquoise. Um, it is, I mean, it does give, it's a very bright blue and that's right, color. right. It makes so, so we, much, it feels like it has that really good vibe to it when, especially when you have a really good piece, you know? So I felt like I was seeing that all over the show floor, um, which made me really happy because, you know, even at, not even at, at Couture, but at JCK as well um, from some of the bigger brands. So I thought that was really cool. But do you feel like it was more of the Sleeping Beauty, the kind of like matrix, yeah, matrix with less turquoise or was yeah, it more like traditional? Exactly. Turquoise? No, just like the, the pure stuff with less matrix showing and more of just like a clean, um, blue to go with some of these simpler styles, which is interesting. And then I feel like when I was talking to the gem dealers about what they were selling or had been selling, or even in the follow-up after Vegas, when I checked in with some people, what I thought was really interesting was that nobody specifically said greens, but they were all throwing green stones at me. So multiple people mentioned mint colors, um, which I thought was really interesting. So mint garnets got a lot of mentions. Um, Savorite garnets too. So we've got all these really vibrant greens, emeralds. Um, I had heard people were buying a lot of, you know, lighter barrels and that kind of thing. So in terms of what we could see coming down the pipeline soon, I think we'll, you know, we'll probably pop a lot of greens, greens and blues, those kinds of hues. Of course, Montana sapphires, um, which anybody I think who's followed my Tucson coverage for a few years is something that I just keep saying again and again, but it does keep coming up again and again. Anybody who carries Montana sapphires, has been doing super well with them. I think it's, yeah. you know, it speaks really well to consumers. It's got not only great color, but obviously American mind, it has a lot to offer. So that again, popped up a few times. I think that falls in this, like these cool blues and greens that we're going to start um, seeing a lot of. Okay. Yeah. I actually had a chance to visit with Rio Grande during the, during my time at JCK and they were taking me through their American Mind collection and how mm. they market it and how they deliver it to retailers. And it was really cool to see, you know, there's some gemstones, like I didn't know uh, they mined Amazonite in Virginia. I did not know mm. that. I thought that was interesting. Cool. And it's, the samples they had there were beautiful. So that's interesting here. I think that Cumbrecken kind of fits in the whole kind of something we talk about all the time, people wanting to know where things are coming from and feeling yeah. better if things are coming locally and they know exactly kind of the the supply chain on them. So, yeah, exactly. Um, I want to ask you, Brecken, about two gemstones I feel like I saw a part of. These are on my list of trends, malachite and lapis lazuli. Can you speak to those at all? Well, I, it's, I it's, like them both and I feel like, and they kind of go with what, what 
you and Ashley have both said, like, I feel like there's a vibe here of creams and blues. Yeah. And I, I love lapis, particularly with the veins of pyrite. I think it's really pretty. But oh, can you talk 100%. a little bit about those two? I feel like well, it's funny well. that you say that because something else that I wrote down separately was like more of a use of like hard stone material or opaque material. And I think, I don't know what's, what's behind that, but I think as you know, this story for the past few years has also been more interesting stones, you know, people just looking for stuff that's different. And so I feel like they're venturing into more of this opaque material. I feel like I was seeing, I wouldn't know if I would call it a trend yet, but more of like designers using like a transparent faceted material up against like a cabochon opaque stone to sort of contrast them. Um, so I, I agree with you, Michelle. I don't, I don't know what's behind that. I think maybe that that material is just really interesting and they're venturing into new areas. Um, you know, they, they tell such a cool story. They look really cool, but I think that's a good point and we should keep an eye on it. I'll be curious to see, you know, through Denver and Tucson next year, what keeps happening with that kind of thing as well. And the hard miners are using a lot of inlay. Um, mm, that's yes. something I've noticed. So I feel like there's definitely a connection there yeah. between those and turquoise and onyx and mother of pearl. Um, yeah. For and sure. pink opal, those types of materials that work so well for having the big swaths of yeah. in a piece. Yeah, for, yeah, for sure. Um, and Brecken, the Hard Rock Summit is this September in Denver. It is this September. I believe it's the 8th to the 11th. And there was also, a, you know, a lot, a lot of buzz about that in Vegas. I know that they had their maybe full. I don't want to speak to that. But I know that a lot of people are excited because they're merging those. You know, previously it was like, minerals and fossils were in one area and the you know the fine gems were in another and now they're putting it all together so you can go see all of it at the same time and I think you know with the conversation about the lack of a Hong Kong show and what's going to happen with that that there's even more of a focus on Denver and Tucson so um, I think that'll be a good uh, test of the market as well so that'll be interesting we'll have to check yeah. back in with you in September then um Lenore what did you see at the shows um, in terms of trends? Trends, yes. And so, you can mention if you saw any trends at the antique show, I don't know if there was something yeah, people were like particularly interested so, in. Yeah, so I mean, something funny, like as I'm listening to you all talking, I think it's really true that, you know, what's old is new again, because I'm thinking, you know, what did I see when I was at the antique show? And I definitely saw enamel. I saw really beautiful malachite lapis pieces, a lot of animal motifs. Um, so I think you know, those, those have always been things people have been interested in. And I'm sure that these antique dealers are sort of looking through their inventory and trying to pull out what's in fashion. Right. Again. Um, but in terms of the shows overall, a trend that I saw that I thought was really interesting was I saw a lot of convertible jewelry, like bracelets that can be flipped over like diamonds on one side, you flip it, sapphires on the other. Yeah. Or a lot of like, you know, those day to night earrings where they're studs and then you can have this really pretty jacket and you can wear them like with or without, um, you know, like statement earrings to studs, those sort of things. Um, yeah, so I saw a lot of convertible jewelry and then all the trends that you guys mentioned, I saw a lot of color. I think that mirrors the, you know, that happy attitude that we've all been talking about. Um, and happily, I've seen a lot of pearl jewelry still, which I'm a big fan of pearls and that's always good to see. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I saw a lot of convertible jewelry as well. Two other things I'll bring up, and I don't know if I'm, this first thing is, I, I don't think it's a trend. I think it's just a huge shift in the market. And people, someone asked a question about this actually before the webinar, so we're going to answer it now. Lab grown diamonds were everywhere, everywhere. And I think it's interesting because I wrote an article a couple months back kind of saying that I think lab grown diamonds, like in a couple years, we're going to look back and we're going to say, we can't even believe there was so much discussion about like lab grown diamonds. Cause when they first came in the industry, they were causing so much controversy and, su and a, such an uproar. Now a few years in, a few years in when, I mean, I kind of count it from 2018 when De Beers introduced light box, like going forward from that, we're just a few years removed from that. And now you see so many brands, uh, not at Couture so much, but at JCK, are now offering a lab grown diamond mine. And, you know, when I was talking to people about it, I'm like, what, you know, why are people buying them? Why are retailers buying them? Why are consumers buying them? You know, from the retailer perspective, a lot of people say, you know, they just don't want to lose a sale. So, you know, if they, if they think consumers are wanting a lab grown diamond, they're going to, they're going to carry at least one line. So that person doesn't go to the jewelry store down the street and get it. So I feel like retailers per, kind of personal feelings about the stones aside are kind of like, seeing that this is not going away, that consumers are, there's more and more consumer interest in this stone. 
And then I was kind of asking, well, why are consumers buying them? And people said it wasn't necessarily that consumers were reducing their budget, but that they were looking to get more for their money. You know, if they could spend X this X amount and get this big of a natural stone, or they could send them that same amount and get a significantly larger lab grown stone. And for a lot of people, that's a draw. So I would say like, I just felt like there were a lot more companies embracing, so to speak, lab grown diamonds. So that's one thing I definitely noticed. Um, and then there was this, this interesting discussion floating around and I didn't see it manifested in jewelry yet, but about the return of white gold um, into fashion, what I would call fashion jewelry. So basically non-bridal. Um, so when I started in 2007, there was not much yellow gold jewelry and you definitely never saw a yellow gold engagement ring. And the yellow gold has been huge in the last couple of years. And now I've heard some whispers about kind of like swinging back. People are going more for white gold now, but I haven't seen that translate yet into any collections or anything. And I don't know if that's going to be something that independent designers embrace, or this is more for kind of the wearable everyday kind of more ubiquitous jewelry. Um, but that was one thing that people are kind of like, talking a little bit about at the shows is white gold. So those are my two things. Ashley, do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, I didn't notice white gold um, really at all, but I mean, there definitely is the, um, the customer for it. And when you get to big diamond pieces, then it always kind of like comes back or like even I'm thinking of a brand like Yeprum that makes, you know, just the most avant-garde, um, crazy kind of red carpet diamond pieces and they still you know using all these white diamonds they still primarily will always produce in um, in white gold just because um, you know to amplify like the whiteness right um, so I think there's always the market for it like I feel like designers always like offer each metal on their on their website but I definitely didn't um I wasn't seeing even mixed metals actually. Well, because I was noting that at, um, at Couture, I didn't see any mixed metals, which made it, when I was like going back and looking over my pictures, um, it made it stand out a little bit more at JCK because I would see a greater, um, a greater array of metals as well as like some people doing mixed metals. So I think it was definitely kind of, catering to different tastes. Um, overall, I still think yellow is having its moment. Um, I saw somebody um, in the chat mention men's jewelry. And I do think where then you get a lot more diversity in metal is in men's jewelry. Like in a way, I feel like um, men's fashion is having such a good moment and men's jewelry in particular, just in kind of a lot of old rules um, and taboos going out the window. Um, so I in a way- I think it's in part by like members, like people like Harry Styles, people like Cody Smith McPhee, like younger, like Gen, Gen uh, millennials and then even Gen Z men are like really pushing the envelope of fashion. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and yeah, so I guess that's one of those, I guess, like trickle down effects where you see like stylists experimenting with their clients and then like that kind of creating, um, a trend in pop culture. But I think where, so in a way, yeah, sorry to stay on my train of thought. So in a way, like, I didn't feel like there was an emphasis on like, oh, well, this is for men or this is for women. But then when you would see designers introduce things like kind of specifically for men, that's where it'd be like rhodium plated, um, you know, and a white gold and introducing like a more muted color palette, just that's maybe a little bit easier for um, a man to adopt who hasn't been wearing much jewelry. I mean, they're probably not going to wear the color probably not going to wear the cocktail ring. That's like a very specific guy who will go for it. So definitely the more um, kind of like darker and cooler toned materials. Um, and I saw some gemstone, um, gemstone bead necklaces and some that like were kind of like targeted towards men from Aisley. 
um, that were very, very cool. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah, men's jewelry is definitely having a thing, having a moment for sure. And it's exciting to see. I like, I like to see people experimenting and wearing different things and kind of getting like, not just the jewelry industry, but fashion in general is getting away from men's women and just kind of saying like, this is for everybody, which is great to see as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any other trends before we move on to talk about our outlooks for the rest of 2022? I think what that's a really good, we really have it covered, I think. Yeah. I think for um, also just to to talk about men, I think like the studs and the multiple piercings for men is a trend. So okay. again, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this was fun just to see from the more, um, I was noticing just like the more fashion forward guys like attending the shows. Um, and this is a younger a younger um type of guy but I was just noticing like a lot of cool young guys with like their multiple studs um and just like walking around in New York I think that's like a very common look for like a young guy to have like multiple piercings and because it's so it's really so demure like it's not very in your face um to just have like a couple of stud earrings in your ear um but so I felt like that, like that layering feels like very on trend for men or a couple of necklaces or obviously like a bracelet's like an easy one to get into. But that layering felt, um, felt like something that we'll see more of. All right. Very interesting. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so we're going to move on and talk a little bit. And somebody had actually asked about this before the webinar. So we're going to talk about it um, anyway. So what about the rest of 2022? Like we talked a little bit about the mood, but I feel like there's so much chatter about a recession. Obviously like high gas prices are a huge point of conversation. So what did, what was, what is your sense of the rest of 2022? And, you know, are we kind of seeing, are we entering kind of a slowdown in the jewelry boom right now? Or is it gonna continue through the holiday season? Um, Lenora, since you're our resident retail reporter, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so there has definitely been talk of a recession. Um, over the weekend, uh, the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, she had made some comments and she said that she didn't think that a recession was necessarily inevitable, but that the interest rates that we're looking at, I mean, the inflation that we're looking at currently, it's way too high. We're looking at like 30 year highs. Um, and then I believe it was last week that the Fed um, announced its highest interest rate hike since like 1994. And that's sort of its way of combating um, those high inflation rates. So, and she had said, you know, that she expects the economy to slow down. Um, you know, we would still see growth, but more of a steady growth rate than what we've been seeing. Um, and I think that mirrors sort of what the major jewelry retailers have been saying. Um, Pandora and Brilliant Earth, both in their recent financial results, they said more or less the exact same thing that they were expecting to see a slowdown, um, particularly in the US market for jewelry. Okay. Yeah, they. I mean, Brilliant Earth lowered its forecast yeah. and um, Pandora said it direct, outright said it expects a slowdown in the US. And then even Signet, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lenore, in its most recent results, it saw its US same, or North American same store sales down 5%, is that correct? Um, or, I'm not going to say yes or no, because I don't remember the exact number, but I do know that they did pretty well. And from what I remember, they did not raise their guidance because they're just not expecting to see these huge growth rates for the rest of the year. Okay. Um, Brecken, thoughts, your thoughts on the rest of 2022? Well, it's an interesting conversation, isn't it? Because it, it does seem like there should be a, you know, a feeling of like, what people t always tell us um, optimist cautiously optimistic excuse me is what we hear all the time but I feel like from the people that I talked to there was still just a lot of optimism for the rest of the year um, I think specifically in the you know stone world when I was talking to people you know despite the fact that I said that the show itself isn't a huge marker for them they don't go into it expecting a lot to happen I was hearing a lot that based on what their clients were doing as exhibitors at the show they were expecting that the, you know, the first few weeks or months after the show to be really strong because they would be needing to replace a lot of inventory. So there was still a lot of feeling that, you know, in the fall, things would be going well because people would need to, 
keep stacking up um, based on buying activity at the show itself, which I thought was interesting. Okay. Ashley, any thoughts on the rest of 2022 based on what you saw? I mean, it's these types of predictions scare me so much. Um, but I feel like people in jewelry are acting very optimistic um, as far as the independent retailers who have had a really good um, last two years. I feel like they are still um, operating in that kind of bubble of having like their best years ever. So while this year it would not likely top last year um, and maybe it will be down like it it's probably still up from like 2019 right um as as far as um the independent retailers who have done really well and the independent designers who have done really well um in that space so maybe and I wonder if how I wonder what the correlation will be at the end of the year with like a Pandora versus that um that kind of different, more high-end market. Sure. So we'll see. I mean, it's it's funny because it feels like such an economically uncertain time, but it kind of has for a while. So I don't really know when to, when yeah. do we leave the COVID good jewelry sale bubble? I don't know if that happens yet. Right. I mean, it feels like we had this similar, I mean, we did have this similar conversation in 2020, right? When the show's all canceled and we were all like oh what's gonna happen we don't know and then all of a sudden you know 2020 to blowing the roof off everything yeah so. yeah I mean I definitely don't mean to sound like a Debbie Downer with what I said before I mean if if you're feeling optimistic like you you should be that's a totally fine way to feel um I think they're you know the people who follow these things they are expecting there to be growth this year it's just not going to be that stellar growth that yeah we yeah recently. yeah which yeah. doesn't seem sustainable it can't right. just grow astronomically all the time right exactly but I think this, that sounds very fair like I don't think it will be a bad year for jewelry by any means um would it like skyrocket the way it did in 2020 of course not or will yeah. it be par with it I imagine it would be like a, a little bit down compared yeah. but maybe that's still up from the years before so in that case like not a bad year no, actually, I think that's a great guess. And that's exactly what I would say. I, I do think it's not, this growth is not sustainable. And I think everyone kind of recognizes that, right? Like this has just been, you know, jewelry ha was, you know, benefited from people traveling less and just being able to out go out less in general. And right. we've discussed that many, many times. And I don't think, I think you're right, 2022. I think the big question is, I don't think 2022 is going to be 2021 or 2020. The big question is, are we going to come out ahead of pre-pandemic, I think? Like, will it be better than 2019? And I'm going to guess it is. I think it's one thing that's really interesting is you're right that, like, it, the jewelers seem to remain optimistic. And definitely at the show, from what I heard, they were buying. Like, they're expecting a big end of the year. You know, Lenore, you mentioned inflation. One note on inflation I would make is that I think when you're talking about a certain save in the, in the market, a lot of couture and the very, very luxury, like the higher end designers with, who work with the higher end independents, I think their clients are less likely to feel the pinch of higher food prices, higher gas prices. Like they're in a position when you're talking about upper middle class or, you know, wealthy, high net worth individuals, they're not in a position where those kind of like upticks in price are affecting what they spend. They might not even, you know, notice them that much, but, you know, for, the middle segment of the market, I think that obviously inflation, higher gas prices, higher food prices are going to hit the market harder. And I would also say it'll be interesting to see what role lab grown diamonds play in this going forward. Like if consumers in, in going into 2023 and beyond are feeling more pinched, are we going to see more of the sales gravitating towards that product? I mean, could be, that'll be definitely an interesting market to watch. And I think definitely worth an update at the end of the year, like where the lab grow market is now versus was at the beginning of the year versus the end of the year, I think is going to be a big tell. Um, so I don't know, people are definitely buying like it's, 
like the good times are just going to keep going on and you know hopefully they do but i think ashley's right i don't think i don't see 2022 topping 2021 in terms of sales another thing another indicator though that independents are very optimistic is look at all the lenore look at all the independents you wrote about who are opening new stores like right. big new stores or renovate renovating stores entirely i mean it's a lot of people and well-known people in the industry and we you know there's just just when you're like oh we we wrote about one and then two weeks later you're writing about another one and again these aren't like small renovations these are opening entirely new stores or renovating a store you know completely renovating a store closing for a couple of weeks and coming out with a completely new look right so yeah so i mean there's definitely a lot to be optimistic about for sure when you know when we get to write stories like that that's always a good day yeah uh, the one point I would make about inflation is I think that you're right. When you're talking about the super, super high earners, they're probably not going to feel inflation the same way. But if you're talking more of like your upper middle class customers, I mean, inflation is going to get to everyone eventually. Um, and I think something inflation was something I was thinking of when I was looking at some of these trends in Vegas, whether we're talking about um, you know, convertible jewelry or like you were talking about the lab grown diamonds. Um, I mean, I think people as prices get higher, they are looking for more for their money, whether that's a lab grown diamond or that's a piece of jewelry that turns into two pieces of jewelry. Yeah, I think the, the convert, right, right. They want to they say, oh, I can wear this earring to work and then put something on it and wear it out at night. Or I can flip this bracelet over and have two different kind of bracelets. Right. I saw that as a big trend too. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, any other thoughts before we break for questions? Any other thoughts about the remainder of 2022? I don't nope. think so. Okay. Um, so um, thanks everyone. That was a great discussion. Um, just as a reminder to our attendees, they still have time to drop questions into the Zoom Q&A box. I'm gonna give our attendees um, a couple minutes to answer additional questions or ask additional questions while I share a word from our sponsor, the Diamond Council of America. DCA offers quality, affordable education for jewelry sales professionals. DCA's convenient online courses are designed to help increase sales and educate sales associates on selling fine jewelry. Visit dcalearning.org to learn more or enroll today. And that is dcalearning.org. Um, I don't think we have any questions come in here. Um, somebody, oh, we did have one come in during the course discussion. Do you think the move to introducing more color has anything to do with what lab diamonds have done to the diamond jewelry offerings? Um, I don't know what what this uh, in a way of like devaluing it in a sense. I I guess that's what they're asking. I I like I'm assuming like that's um I'm assuming that that's what that means, and I I don't believe so. Um, if I'm understanding that that question correctly if, if people are like off of diamonds I don't think it's like that um I think it's just a little more diversity of offerings and like more designers because the market is so crowded right now means more experimentation like I just feel like people are kind of going in more directions than they would um in the past at least um at least in the in the um, American market or like in top kind of top cities around the West, because it is funny when I think of going to like a Vicenza Oro, there is such a more distinctive look almost to like the Italian jewelry designers. Like they tend to stay like a little bit more the same where I feel like um, the independent designers, particularly here, like really go in so many directions. Um, so I really think it's just a matter of that. So, so many people experimenting and then you see people are accustomed to seeing more now and then you kind of like see what sticks and resonates with people. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm not exactly clear on what lab diamonds have done to jewel, diamond jewelry offerings either, but I don't think, I agree with Ashley, I don't think that it's more color is coming in. I don't think those two things are related. I think, you know, kind of industry opinions on lab grown diamonds aside, I think consumers are interested in them and consumers accept them. And like I said, I think for consumers, it's a lot of, it's just about value. 
it's about, I can get a bigger stone for my money or why am I going to pay X amount for natural diamond stud earrings when I can pay X amount and get lab grown diamonds and they're still diamonds. And I'm sorry if people don't like that answer, but that's just the way it is. And I think the industry needs to do a lot more thinking about how consumers think and less thinking about how they personally feel about it. That's my opinion about lab grown diamonds. And Lenore, I know you agree because you wrote that in a piece a long time ago. I have a lot um, of I'll, yes. Also on the note of lab grounds, I think what's interesting is um, when we talk to retailers about like, what are people buying? And especially like in the bridal market, so like what are people on average asking for? The carrot weights have gotten a lot bigger. Like people don't really want a diamond under a carrot um, no. anymore. It's kind of interesting, right? Like people, I feel like years ago, people would be like, well, I just want to be like one carrot. And people have really like up the ante on what they want. So I think that's where the lab grown diamond can um, come in and really offer something. That being said, like the lab grown diamonds just have really not hit yet. In my opinion, um, I still feel it's so niche and not mainstream when you talk to retailers and um, a lot of designers that it's very interesting. It's like that moment really hasn't come. It's, it doesn't feel very prevalent to me. I don't think I know anyone who's gotten a lab grown diamond for their engagement ring either. My best friend has one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't have yeah. any one either. Um, but I think to Ashley's point, I think we're in our jewelry bubble a lot. And it's something that's very prevalent to us because we talk about it all the time. But when I talk to people outside of the industry, it's either A, not on their radar, or B, they don't really have that strong of an opinion. They're like, oh, I don't yeah. know, maybe I'd look into it. Like it's it's never a hard no or like a super enthusiastic yes. Yeah, as someone just wrote here, lab grown are huge in our store, engagement rings, study rings, embraces, et cetera. Yeah, uh, my oh, other best are? friend. Yeah, and, uh, my other best friend has lab grown, just got lab grown study rings for her anniversary. And her thinking was she's a little girl. She and her husband are both working people. They don't have tons of disposable income. She's like, I just want a simple one carat pair of diamond earrings to wear every day. She's a mom with a job on the run. If she loses one, it's not a huge deal. They didn't want to spend a ton of money. And that's just how she looked at it. She wasn't all like, it was all about money for her. She wasn't all wrapped up in all this other kind of you know, thoughts about it. Like we get in the industry, like, oh, they're ruining the industry. And people, consumers just don't see it like that. Consumers see it like, here's something that I can spend less money on and get the same looking product. So yeah, just passing along, not, not taking a personal stand, just passing along that information. Um, so along the diamond uh, front, someone else here asked, does anyone have a comment about Martin Rappaport diamond, Martin Rappaport's diamond presentation and the move to abandon the Kimberly process unless they change so some definitions on blood diamonds? Um, so I did not attend Martin Rappaport's breakfast this year for various reasons. Um, so this, and then right now is the Kimberly Process Intercessional and the Kimberly Process Civil Society Coalition, I think, is that what it's called? Yeah. Sounds right. Civil Society Coalition put out a statement today, like <laughs> trying to pressure the Kimberly Process in light of what's going on in Ukraine to expand the definition of blood diamonds to include Russian diamonds because of what's happening in Ukraine. I don't know it is this Martin Rappaport's move to abandon the Kimberly process, which I think he left the Kimberly process a long time ago. Um, I don't know who's abandoning it, but this conversation about the definition of blood diamonds has been going on since at least 2016. Um, I'd have to look at my dates, but there was a year, and I think it was 2016, it might have even been before when the United States was actually chair of the Kimberly process. Every year, a different nation serves as a chair. And that was the United States, the year they were chair, that was their big push was to try to expand the def the current definition of blood diamonds is diamonds that funded by rebel groups, diamonds that fund rebel groups that are trying to overthrow legitimate governments. So, um, and it's a very narrow definition and that's been a point of contention for years. And that's been a point of debate every year. The US was unsuccessful in getting it changed. And every time it's come up since it has gone shot down. This is the story, uh, you uh, you all know about this is a story I write every year that nobody reads um, yeah. I we yeah. have this joke about this story <laughs> is like here's my time to spend two days writing about what happened in the Kimberly process meeting so nobody could read it 
And when this whole thing came up with the Ukraine, obviously the, the invasion, you know, all these, oh, what is the Kimberly process doing? What is the Kimberly process doing? And it's like, well, the Kimberly process has a very nef- their narrow definition of conflict diamonds or blood diamonds, whatever you want to call them. I don't, I don't know who Martin is calling to abandon the process. He's already, I, do, I don't think he, I don't know exactly what his call was, but I don't, it, the problem with the Kimberly process, and I've written about this time and time again, is you need a complete consensus to change anything. Every single nation has, has to agree. There right. are certain nations that have again and again and again dug their heels in and they won't expand the definition. So I don't, I don't know what else to say about it. Again, it's like, it's interesting to me because I've written about this so many times and it doesn't seem like anybody paid attention or cared until this issue with Ukraine comes up and then everybody, oh, what about the Kimberly process? Well, this has been a Kimberly, an issue with the Kimberly process that people have been talking about for years. I don't know who's abandoning it or how Martin Rappaport thinks it should change or he's going to change it. I'm not, I'm not clear on that. I didn't attend his talk, but that's just my take on the, this kind of long-standing feud over the definition of blood diamonds. So that's what I have to say. Uh, Unanimous vote is a tough ask for sure. Yeah. And we've written that many, many times and I don't, you know, I'm not sure who Martin's calling on to abandon it or what he thinks that's going to do, but you know, that's been a sticking point with the KP for a long time. It didn't just come up now. That's all the questions we have time for today. Thanks again to our editors, Brecken, Ashley, and Lenore for sharing your thoughts today and to all our attendees for joining us. My next question will return Tuesday, June 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern with Associate Editor Lenore Fido hosting an episode about live stream shopping. Thanks again for joining us today and please take care.